Welcome, everyone. And if you're wondering what session you were in, we are here to talk about hybrid networks and interoperability between uh, private, private permission networks and public chains. Uh, I'm Sham Nagarajan, and uh, I'm an executive partner with IBM, and I focus on Web3 and sustainability and have been in this space for the last uh, six, seven years. Um, really excited about this particular topic of hybrid networks. Uh, I IBM's engagement with Hyperledger has been uh, really big uh, since the inception. And now we're starting to see different patterns emerge in the market. And uh, this is part of that session to talk about those uh, patterns. I want to introduce Meda and as well as Dano. I'm going to have them introduce themselves and uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Sham. Uh, Meda Parlakar, I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of Casper Labs, and we're the team behind the public Casper protocol, which is a public uh, decentralized permissionless protocol purpose-built for the enterprise. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here to talk about hybrid networks. Uh, we're learning a lot, too, from enterprise about their desire to uh, tap a little bit into uh, public networks. Uh, my name is Dan O'Farron. I'm a principal software engineer at Hedera Networks. And I kind of wear two different public network hats. One, I'm working on the Hedera network, um, doing a lot of work on the smart contract system right now. And the other network hat that I wear is Ethereum mainnet. I'm one of the maintainers on Hyperledger Besu. Uh, that also makes me an Ethereum core developer. I call into the, to the calls on occasion when they're more talking about the EVM stuff. Um, and I've been involved in the Besu project since it came on board at Hyperledger. I'm also currently on the TSC serving as vice chair. Thank you very much, um, Dana and, and Meda. This session is a birds of feather session. So while we have individual points of view, we welcome um, the audience. If they have a point of view or if you have questions, clarification, feel free to um, bring them up and we'll, we'll have address them as we go along. OK, so hybrid networks. Um, here's my view and definition of hybrid networks. The concept of a hybrid network is um, when one blockchain network crosses over either in terms of interconnectivity or interoperability into another network, and there may or may not be reciprocation from the other network, but they are um, interconnected or interoperable is what I term as hybrid network. Um, why are we seeing these? Is, why is there a necessity for them? Right. And this morning, you had uh, Rob, Rob Palatnik, and as well as uh, Chris uh, from Fujitsu stand up and uh, say they're developing several applications that are in the spaces of financial services, institutional asset management, insurance. Great. But these networks don't oper operate in isolation. There comes a point where it has done what it was designed to do, but it needs to grow. It needs to have that extensibility to take proofs or assets from one network into another network. Why would you do that? Um, especially why would you take it into a public network is um, maybe there's a need for monetization and liquidity. Maybe there's a need for um, um, access to a bigger ecosystem so you don't have the, the uh, burden of building a huge consortia. So when you consider all these facts that bring uh, about the right operation of the hybrid networks, it, it actually seems very natural in terms of evol evolution. Um, are you giving up something with respect to going from a permission in a private world into a public world? Yeah, there's a little little bit of uh, uh, a privacy and security that you do give up, So, which comes back to the question of what are you going to take into the public world? How are you, what information are you exchanging? And is that something that you can allow it to be, um, if the network gets, the public network does get compromised, you'd be okay with having that you know, as a proof, not as a, a compromising your permission network. So these are all the questions that has to be addressed very carefully, and these hybrid networks has to be architected in the right way. So there are more use cases that um, I'm happy to talk, but I do want Dano and Meda's perspective on what they think about this and then we'll get into those details. Meda? Thanks. Um, 
From my perspective, I think that permissioned networks and private networks have definitely have a place in enterprise that goes without saying. Enterprises really, really want privacy around their data. They want to maintain competitive advantage. They don't, they're not yet ready to collaborate on public networks, right? We, the time is not yet now. They also need, oftentimes, you know, bespoke networks that are tailored for specific core piece of functionality, capability, and better throughput and performance than public networks can give them. But by the same token, if they are working with customers or if they are servicing a customer-facing industry, they will need to provide greater trust than a permissioned network can provide, right? A private network, a private permission network doesn't actually have the same level of trust as a decentralized public network. And so something as simple as just shipping a block hash to a public network and getting back a Merkle proof that can demonstrate that your blocks haven't been tampered with because the hashes have remained immutable will be important in establishing customer trust. So what's an excellent example of this? For example, let's say supply chain, right? You need to keep your supply chain data private for security reasons. Those transports, the, the trucks, uh, the shipping you know, information cannot go on a public network. But if you're transporting food, let's say for example for a large restaurant chain and you have a problem with a meat supplier, consumers will want to know provably that you haven't gone back and munged your data, right? That we can prove that this data has, you know, that the source of this meat is in fact from this supplier and you can expose that as you wish, right? But you can also more importantly prove that we haven't gone back and tampered with the data later on when the stakes are high. And so this is a, a really excellent ut utilization actually of the public protocol because the amount of computation and the cost, the gas costs for that are very, very low. And it's not like you have to send every block over to the mainnet. You could send every 100 blocks or every 50 blocks, right? And that will still give you the, this, the benefits of the security from the public protocol on that permissioned private chain. So um, from my perspective on hybrid networks, um, I reflect on the part where I'm, you know, I've got a foot both in the public network community with Ethereum mainnet and a lot of the other stuff and, and the private network community, which is a lot of the enterprise interest in, in blockchains. And one of the, the, big, the big developing themes that's growing in the public network community is the notion of a modular blockchain. On a modular blockchain is where you take certain aspects of it and you split it up and you mix and match it like Legos. And the layers are like execution layer, settlement layer, data availability layer, consensus layer. And you can take those pieces and you can put it together. Um, one example that I see of this already is what's, what's called layer two in Ethereum, where they've written a separate set of, of, of an EVM type blockchain, but they don't have uh, a consensus layer of their own. They rely on the Ethereum level one. Now, these are both public networks for both of them, so I wouldn't really call them a hybrid network because it's public-public. There's not too much hybrid about it. But that's an example of how you might take these Lego pieces and stack them together in different ways. Um, one way that, that Hedera has that does this public-private type mix-up um, where you can take one, one layer and use it in a pri private and a public is we have a pluggable HCS consensus layer for Hyperledger Fabric. We can take the services of the orderer and we can map that onto a Hedera consensus topic. So you would use the Hedera cons consensus engine to put your orderer hashes in and let that public piece handle all the ordering and the distribution and data availability issues for you. So then your, your fabric network wouldn't need to maintain an orderer across however many different organizations you have one trusted one. And that's on a public network and it's hashes so there's no privacy coming out. And then you take that information in your private network. So you take these Legos and stack them together and so the hybrid is when some pieces are in the public and some are in private. So that's a bit of my perspective. Thank you. You know, um, why don't we start with you guys a little bit on uh, business use cases and application. I know we got some examples that uh, you want to bring up. One of the things we're hearing a lot about is uh, customers that are running Hyperledger instances are really interested uh, in tokenizing the assets. So they are tracking assets on Hyperledger instances and want to get exposure to liquidity. So what they're wanting to do is bridge those assets um, over to a public network. 
and then issue a token, which is an asset-backed token, like an asset, real asset-backed stablecoin, right? So you're seeing this in a lot of the, the CFI and large banking institutions that are looking to gain liquidity. And now that they're getting transparency, thanks to th their blockchain instances, they can now take advantage of these uh, bigger markets um, using the public trust of a decentralized protocol. So this is one use case we're absolutely seeing. We're also hearing a lot about brands wanting to bridge NFTs over. You know, so they're creating these NFTs that are collectibles and their customers want to be able to bridge these over to OpenSea and Ethereum, for example, or other public networks so they can tap into that larger Web3 community um, and, and, you know, get value, but then also try to bring some of that Web3 community into their brands, right, into their ecosystem. And so we're seeing a good amount of traction there as well. Um, particular use cases? Um, probably one of, one of the biggest use cases I think has already been gone over is the ability to, to get your public record out there and to get the state proof from a public route into private data. Um, because one of the things in these in these hybrid chains, you don't want to put your public data, even if encrypted, in a public network. Because once it's out, it's out. It just takes leaking a private key, and people can figure it out. Um, but when you put your hashes in there, and you put like a Merkle tree or some other structure that you can prove into it, um, and have you know you know 32 32 bytes can hide a whole lot, um, and can prove a whole lot if you structure it properly. So a lot of these use cases out there would need to make sure that they can minimize. Um, the amount of data they put on these public networks. And that's valuable because some of these posting on public networks can get quite expensive, especially when you're talking about stuff like, you know, Ethereum mainnet when it's legendarily very volatile gas costs and, and such. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present three use cases that um, I'm currently working at. And... Uh, the first one, um, may the Casper Labs and IBM work together, is around uh, patent, intellectual property and patent tokenization. Um, this is, a, this is a, a startup called IPV, and they are uh, based in uh, Switzerland and uh, North America. They actually um, brought the information from all the patent offices into a single registry and can do analytics and used Hyperledger Fabric to actually create ownership um, provenance information on the patents. So then they can provide um, irrefutable proof to their clients when they come to appeal for uh, unique uh, patents that they're filing and make uh, analytics predictions on the possibility of this being breached in other markets and so on and so forth. That was phase one. What they quickly realized, and I'm gonna have uh, Mayda talk about this a little bit more, is because they had access and already um, established a network, a private permission network with, uh, with all the right parties inside it for authenticity and provenance of all these patents, now they could create NFTs out of these patents that can then be used in public network for tradability, for licensing, for loyalty, and the life cycle tracking of the patent with the patent offices. This is a huge, huge innovation in the world of patents. If you think about it, any organization, if you're part of a startup or even a large enterprise, you file patents all the time, but only I think about 20% um, of your patents that you file is actually being used within your organization. Rest is either sitting on shelf or gets expired um, and you're continuously paying. And this idea of tokenization allows you to open up this asset, which is an illiquid asset that's sitting on your balance sheet to be able to trade or license and make it monetizable in the market. So a uh, very cool uh, use case, and Meda, maybe you want to talk about this as well. Yeah, definitely. It's a hybrid implementation. The negotiation of the terms of sale of a patent um, within IPWE's infrastructure happens on Hyperledger because they needed the privacy channel, so it's only a two-party you know, negotiation that happens where the terms of the sale are negotiated and agreed upon. But then when the NFT is minted, it's minted on the public Casper network with the patent ID 
identified and the ownership is tracked on the mainnet. Now, interesting thing is we are, we are engaging with IPV for phase two, and this is where things get really interesting, is they are coming up with patent bundles. So now if you can imagine, let's just take the cell phone vertical as an example. So if you can imagine Samsung, Qual Qualcomm, Nokia, will all have patents that are related given a certain vertical or value proposition, and they'll each patent some portion of the technology and they each own those patents. Now, individually, those patents may not be terribly valuable, but if you could bundle them together, the sum is far, far greater than the sum of the parts. And so what they're now going to do is create these NFT bundles of patents that can now be sold together, and then when the NFT is sold, uh, and the, the royalties are automatically distributed because that's all encoded within the contract. So you'll be able to take this NFT bundle, negotiate the terms of sale and hyperledger, but then the royalties and everything are all tracked via smart contract. And then the NFT is transferred in its ownership with all the patents bundled into it on the public Casper protocol. So this is an excellent use case of this public-private hybrid that we've talked about where you get the best of both technologies. So the next one that I got is um, actually in the world of ESG and sustainability. As you all know, corporates today have to have some form of shareholder reporting on sustainability. And frankly, I think an uh, organization that doesn't have a well-established net zero goal, they get ranked in terms of uh, uh, marketability in the, in the market. So uh, this is more true in Europe than in some of the other parts. In North America, it's purely about complaints. But organizations are proactively putting in plans to track their sustainability goals and move towards a net zero or a net positive uh, structure. Now, the issue is, I will tell you, as ESG investors, I don't know if you own ESG investments, but ESG investors struggle to hold the invested companies accountable to the KPIs they actually uh, originally commit to before the investments. Um, and Obviously, as a as a uh, investee or the or the company in which that you get invested, do not want to share too much information about their metrics all the time to the investors. They do it on a on a I think it's a yearly basis is the term right now. And by the time that information gets transferred to the investors, it's too late. They can't make any decisions. They have to still continue with the uh, investments, uh, even though the ethos was was something different. So what we are seeing is um, where organizations are starting to track their internal sustainability metrics on private permission protocols um, like Hyperledger Fabric and um, are then looking at ways to report to the market that they are either meeting the metrics or not meeting the metrics with you know, indisputable proof of their metrics being held in a private permission uh, network. And this is where we are doing some work with the uh, Hadera Network right now on, um, s with some companies on establishing this for recyclability and as well as uh, you know, responsible sourcing initiatives and the likes. So again, the public world knows that you are still, you know, it, it has proof of where your metrics are at all the time. It doesn't have the details of what exactly those metrics are, but the private permission world has auditability at any point to show that they are computed and they are on track or off track to that. So uh, interesting concept, starting to see a lot of traction in the market, um, interest from organizations. This is uh, in, in both the sides, the financial services community is very interested in this, but also the individual companies themselves and how they're tracking their sustainability initiatives as, uh, um, as very uh, adapting this quickly. The uh, last pattern that I'll, I'll tell you, actually it's not a pattern, it's a real customer. I can't tell you the names because that's how our world is. Um, in the world of CBDC, right, Central, Central Bank uh, Digital Currency, we see a need for private permissioned way of managing uh, what they call as an asset ledger across different wholesale banks and the central bank. And that being occurred on a, a private permission world um, in a, you know, it could be Fabric, it could be you know, Casper, Hadera, all these worlds where 
there is control, there is permission, and there is access, but only for the parties that are already trusted and can be good. When they bridge it into the, the, the retail CBDC world, which has needs to have a level of decentralization and uh, um, and uh, you know uh, anonymization, especially with the cash aspect. You know, <laughs> a big issue with uh, central bank digital currency is that when I hold central bank uh, a digital dollar or digital euro, I don't want the central bank to know what I'm going and purchasing on and doing analytics on it and coming back to. Um, stop me from doing my way of living. So there is a need for a certain level of uh, a, a wall between what is visible and what's not visible. And this is just pilots that's going on in different countries where they're looking at the interoperability between the public and the uh, permission chains. So just some, some thoughts to think about. Um, real applications, I think the world is here. Um, if you ask me five years ago, I would say the world is just private permission. Public has got is, is too involved with primarily cryptocurrencies. But now the world is changing. You see, I'm here, but two other representatives from the public world. So uh, we the hybrid networks is here. Any other comments? So as I was hearing you talk about your use cases, these are some all very serious very important, but I think uh, a growing use case that's going to start showing up that is not quite as as relevant as ESG is is the world of online gaming and ES and uh, and AAA games. Um, you could one of the re things you can do with a hybrid ledger is you can keep the ledger public, but you can change some of the rules of the ledger that might fit some of the needs of your games. For example, if you keep all your game pieces on the Ethereum network on mainnet. Um, you can't place rules such as if you violate our terms of service and stream some some stuff on Twitch that we um, can't associate ourselves with. You can't take back their game pieces. You know that's a very common thing that people like to do. And so so games that you know want have total ownership to be important, they'll stay on Ethereum mainnet. But those won't be all the games that are going to want to use blockchain. There's going to be companies who are okay with that sort of an approach. So you would use a hybrid blockchain and you would keep the data on a rollup that gives you the privileges. If, if, if your user winds up on a NoFAQ list, you could probably um, repossess them, some of their game pieces if they do um, the things that, that might not be compatible with the way you want to run your, run your game system. So that's some of the, the, the advantages of going to a hybrid network is you can enforce some of these rules that regulation might require of you that you could not do on a public network. Because there's, you know, on, on Ethereum mainnet, if you don't have the keys, your assets just don't get transferred. So that's that's simultaneously an advantage and a restriction based on whether you're a public or a permissioned um, type situation. I think we are getting, yeah, please. Can I, can I, uh, I was thinking about the use cases that you discussed before about the IP. I was, I was thinking, why do you need the, the, private, uh, the private side when you can run a privacy preserving matching algorithm directly on mainnet? So you would avoid to have the private network. Why do you do that? Look, um, there is also history behind how this started, but what enterprises w want is to negotiate with other parties on permission networks. They don't want to do that on the public network. Yeah, but we we'll do that in a privacy, privacy preserving way, so that without leaving ciphertext on the main ledger. So as long as you leave commitments... If you can create a side ledger on a public public uh, network, uh, you can do it that way. Yeah, of course. So this so is. Because this is the this is where we started. We started with the hyperledger fabric and doing it as a permission system, and then eventually decided we were going to tokenize those assets in a public network, and that's how we built the bridge. That said, um, if you want to do this as a side chain and do it primarily between the parties that are involved, and eventually put the proof into the public network and tokenize on the main net, that's fine. That's perfectly acceptable hybrid situation as well. Did you think also the other way around? So, the, as you probably know, you can set up. Uh, I'm talking. Uh, I'm one of the architects of Fabric. Uh, you can set up Fabric in such a way everyone can read the ledger, but only certain nodes can write. So, essentially, it becomes a public network, but only the writers are permissioned. You, you can also set up like this. So, if, if you manage to have a ledger that is obfuscated, you can distribute essentially to everyone, but only the block who can assemble the blocks are permissioned. So, so you can create an economy directly on fabric. I don't disagree, and that's completely possible. 
Um, the two key drivers that I think is, is important, one is liquidity, right? I think um, the key reason why you would want to go to a public ledger is to have some form of monetization from the liquidity form. The second one is a bigger ecosystem access. And I, I will tell you, in my seven years of building consortia, they are really difficult. Governance and managing them is an enormous task. And you saw here how many companies, how many consortia Torpedo are done. So I believe this is a new pattern that can jump through that hoop of having to form a consortia and get everyone to agree on their patterns by using public networks to have concrete proof in, um, in, in working the same, same exact end goal that you need. If I may, no, 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 no. Sure. No, no, no. how do you deal with the client? So how do you deal with the aspects of, when you go to public, uh, public uh, the main net, public net, you have at least two things that you have to talk about. Uh, governance, two issues that you have to deal with. G governance of the network, so who can decide, to, uh, who can change the rules of the public network, and fluctuation of the fees. How do you deal, how, how do the <laughs> client deals with this kind of thing? I, I'm going to have the, the public network uh, advocates talk about it. I have a point of view, but I want them to talk about it. So uh, with respect to the Casper network, the governance is held by the public validators, and Casper Labs sits as an advisor. Um, we don't run nodes in the network. From my perspective as a technologist and developing a protocol and a platform, we provide, I believe the platform and the technology needs to provide the capabilities to the participants and users of the network to govern the network. And so what that means is we empower the persons that are holding the stake in the Casper network to vote on chain or vote on governance issues and allow themselves to be heard. We provide capabilities for enterprises to govern their integrations on the Casper network. They can upgrade their contracts. They can revoke their contracts. They can even recover and revoke keys if they wish to do that because we provide the capabilities in the technology itself. So an enterprise can really govern their own implementation of Casper, and tr even on mainnet, right? So we felt that that was really important. So an example, a hard fork is a great example. God forbid there's a hard fork on Casper network, and now in a lot of other protocols, you'll see two copies of your contracts. In Casper, we provide tooling that the, the company can decide to kill the contracts. They can kill both contracts on both forks, or they can choose to say, we're going on this side of the fork, and we're going to kill the other one. Right, so I look at it from providing the capabilities versus actually getting in there and doing the governance. So we allow the companies to do, perform their own governance around how the public chain, how they interact with the public chain. Um, gas fees, right, that was the other question. Yeah, so we have some innovations that are coming out as part of Casper 2.0. Um, we will be offering contracts that can stake the network and contracts that can pay for their own execution. There is a novel gas fee mechanism that will be coming at the end of Q1. Uh, can't talk too much about it just yet because it's, it's just coming out of research now, but it will stabilize gas fees in mainnet. So for gas fees on Hedera, our fees are fixed to fiat. We have an exchange rate on chain that will move the cost in HBAR to what the fixed fee is. So if it's going to cost you a tenth of a cent to do a transfer, it's always going to cost you that converted amount within a day's fluctuation, there is some fluctuation. But I think that that gets to a higher point, is that when you integrate with your public network, you need to do your homework and, and be prepared for what you find on the public network. If you figure out what's most important to you and find a network that fits your needs. Not everyone needs to be on Ethereum mainnet. Um, you know, maybe maybe Avalanche is right for you, maybe a Polkadot or a Cosmosm chain is appropriate for you, maybe Hedera is the right place for you. But when you're looking at these, these Lego pieces to put together, um, just like building any other system, you need to do your homework and see what you can control and what you can't control. And if you can't control it, make sure you're okay with the range it operates within. And if you don't want to spend 500 bucks to deploy a smart contract, maybe you need to wait until Sunday morning to post your contracts on Ethereum. <laughs> And governance, that's right. That's another important part. Um, Hedera, it's a public network, but it's not a permissionless right now. Um, there's 23 different council members right now that, that govern the ruling of Hedera right now, um, kind of like the Visa network. Um, and they're separate, and you know, they're big names you'd recognize. Um, I'm totally blanking on. What were some of the ones I should list, Brett? Uh, Google, 
Google, Google, IBM, Boeing. Those are yeah. Those are the, the, the those are the types of companies that are the putting representatives on this board to 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 control the fees, to control the technologies. And just recently, we turned on to update the software. You need to get like two thirds of them to sign a message before we can update the software on the network. So there is there's you know if governance of a network is important to you, and you don't like the wild west of Ethereum mainnet, there is there's really controlled stuff like like Hedera out there that'll probably suit your needs. All right, I, I know we are a little past our time. Um, I'm gonna do a quick wrap up and we are open for questions. We can talk offline here as well. Um, NetNet is, hybrid networks are a reality. They're already happening in the market right now whether you like it or not. There are projects um, like the Cactus and as well as the Weaver project which incidentally are going to be merged together and is now called Cacti, um, that offers you the capability to interoperate between hybrid, between networks, private permission, and as well as the public networks. So there are instances of where real adoption is going to grow. I encourage you, as you are designing your, your systems, to consider the long-term growth of your network when making decisions on technology as well. So um, just things to keep in mind and have an open mind to adopt this in your organization. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. We're doing a demo of uh, the Cactus Weaver in uh, integration um, with Hyperledger and Casper, I think tomorrow, right, Sean? Yeah, tomorrow at 4.55, so if you want to come check out the demo. I'm not sure where it's going to be. <laughs> They'll probably announce the room. It's at 12.35? Oh, well, forget that. I didn't know what I was talking about. 12.35 tomorrow, I guess. And while we're plugging sessions, I have a session next on integrating the EVM into Hyperledger, not Hyperledger, uh, Hedera, integrating the Hyperledger base of EVM in Wilco 2B. And then I'm sitting on another security fireside chat um, right after that. And let me see what room. That's why I got my phone out so I can figure out what rooms I have to go to. The EcoSem room. Is that this room or is that the room next door? So I'll be, I'll be back here in a couple hours, so. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.